Please take your seats. Caribbean Court of Justice Appellate Jurisdiction on appeal from the Court of Appeal of Barbados, CCJ Appeal Number 4 of 2017, between Ronaldo Anderson Allen versus the Queen, for the hearing of the appeal this morning. Can we have the appearances for the court, please? Thank you. May it please your honors, I appear on behalf of the appellant, and with me is Ms. Shadia Simpson, Mr. Donica Spence, and Ms. Daniel Motley. Yes. In this dishonorable court, I appear in association with my learned colleague, Ms. Olivia Davis, for the respondent. Yes, good morning, Councillor. Um, Mr. Holder? One minute. Yes, good morning. Will you come to the podium? <laughs> Yes, Your Honours, on the 8th day of May 2018, this Honourable Court made an order at page 285 of the bundle. In essence, that the proposed appeal raises points of law of public importance in relation to the relevance of an early guilty plea. The chronology of events in relation to this appeal are well documented and are before you. I wish to start by contextualizing the importance of the issue that I propose to raise in this appeal relative to the early guilty plea, which deals with paragraph 43 of the judgment of the Court of Appeal, which I read with your leave. While the general principle is that a discount can be given on a determinate sentence in the face of an early guilty plea. A discount is incompatible with an indeterminate sentence. The question of a discount in this case does not therefore arise. I believe that some history in relation to this matter is the most important. On the 12th of July 2016, <coughs> 12th of July 2016, the House of Assembly, the lower house, passed an amendment to the Master Square Act, abolishing preliminary inquiries into indictable matters. <coughs> this amendment was passed on the 27th of July 2016 in the Senate. The purpose and intent of that amendment was to fast track matters 
to the high court for trial, among them capital. This would have been done because of the chronic backlog in relation to preliminary inquiries. On the 18th of September, 2018, in the House of Assembly, an amendment was passed to the offenses against the Persons Act and an amendment to the Constitution of Barbados. Unfortunately, this was, the amendment to the Constitution was defeated on the 7th of November, 2018, in the Senate. So this bill has not been promulgated as yet. And the, Constitu the, the amendment was seeking what? Was seeking to amend Section 15 of the Constitution in relation to the mandatory character of the death penalty arising out of the decision made by this Honorable Court in Nervé and Severin. But it was defeated. At that time, when the discussion was being undertaken by the learned Attorney General, at that time there were 62 persons on remand awaiting trial relative to murder. But Mr. Holder, this isn't a death penalty case. It's uh, yeah, a that, life that, sentence. On, on, so yes, Your Honor, I, I understand that. What, what I'm trying to, 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 to indicate to the court, there were 62 people who were on, on remand awaiting trial for capital. So that in relation to a guilty plea, for example, a supposition, suppose hypothetically all of those 62 persons were to indicate that they are willing to plead guilty to the lesser count and is accepted. Then the question... Wait, wait, just listen, just listen. These are persons who are... Awaiting trial. In trial. On murder. On remand for murder. Yes. I see. Okay. Yes, go ahead. So that if hypothetically all of these 62 persons were to say that we want to plead guilty to manslaughter, and it is so accepted by the learned director of public prosecutions. And they came down and pleaded guilty. And having pleaded guilty, they were sentenced to life imprisonment, to an indeterminate sentence. Then the question must be posed, having pleaded guilty to manslaughter, even though you pleaded guilty, they are, give, they are being given the maximum sentence as prescribed. Do you mean all of them? All it, 62 of them? Suppose, yes, yes, yes. yes I see. Okay. Suppose it, it so, is, so, so that hypothetical doesn't invite us to consider the nature of the offense that each committed. You're simply... They were right, they're, they're charged with murder, with capital. Yes, I understand that. Yes. What I'm saying is that they were charged in 62 different cases. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so that the... The gravity and the nature of the cases would vary. That is correct. There were 62 of those. That, that is correct, Your Honor. Right. So to, to, so to give one sentence to cover all 62, it sounds a little bit... Uh, no, 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 I mean, they, they, I'm saying that they come down individually mm -hmm. and they're pleading, they're, pleading, they're pleading guilty on an individual basis, not on, on a carte blanche. Mm -hmm. No, I understand you. Yeah, right. uh, yeah but, but what, if that happens, what, what, what are you saying to us? But, no, I mean, but and they're, they're, set, they're pleading guilty Mm -hmm. Given an indeterminate sentence yeah. of life imprisonment, then no, no discount has been given to them. Mm -hmm. So in your, uh, your argument is that once a person pleads guilty, he can't get a life sentence. Can't, I didn't, I mean, is it your argument that once a person pleads guilty, he cannot get a life sentence? No, 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 obviously it depends on the circumstances. Ah. That, that is understood. That's the point. It, that is understood. Yes. It, it depends on the circumstances. We, we, that is understood. Yes. Then, but, this, but the, then, then Mr. Four, you're not taking us anywhere. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Because everything comes down to the individual case. Understood. understood. So, so, so what, what really is the thesis the, the, that your hypothesis right. 
um, was intended to establish? What, what's the thesis? That, that the, based on the ruling in section, as per Ronaldo Alim, mm -hmm. the, the learned court of appeal indicate that a discount is incompatible with an in, indeterminate sentence. You may take it that we are fully mm -hmm. aware of that pronouncement. Yes, right. And we are conscious that it is what you are directing yourself right. to. So, because my argument that irrespective, the arriving out of this, irrespective of the circumstances of the individual case, if one takes this at first blush, because nothing has, nothing has emanated from the decision in the court of appeal relative to a discount. Right. It has said poignantly, the question of a discount does not therefore arise. End of statement. No, but it, 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 that what they're saying is that once we decide, Precisely. having looked at all the circumstances and all the aggravating and mitigating factors, that an indeterminate sentence, a life sentence, should be given in this particular case, okay. that a discount is then incompatible. Yes. Such a horrific crime, a discount is inappropriate. But with the greatest respect, I, I beg to differ with the greatest respect because I'm reading, but the general principle is that a discount can be given on a determinate sentence in the face of an early guilty plea. So they, they, they're disti this is distinguishing between a determinate sentence and an indeterminate sentence. Yes. Yes. But so that there's no distillation relative to the individuality of the case in relation to your discount being considered. Which is why I think we are waiting for right. you to give us right. in, what, in relation to your discount. What is the individualization in relation to this case? The the circumstances relative to, to the, the, the the remorse exhibited right. and pronounced by yeah. by by the, the appellant by the appellant. The fact he had no previous convictions, this is his first offense before. Right. All these things were, were factors that ought to have been taken into consideration by the learned trial judge at the time. The, the, any prospect of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. so, so that by, by we understand and appreciate the punishment and the deterrence principle, other factors based on the law must be taken into consideration. Right. So, uh -huh. Mr. Hull, I thought you would take us first to show us that this was not a case where your client should have been given a life sentence. Start there. Perhaps that would be more useful. And then you could go to your early guilty plea no, and no so on. So that I will start them. Well, for me, with respect. Right. I, I, Thank you. I can start by then looking at the, the, the ground number one in relation to the whole aspect of the, the judge. The judge Failing to even consider, in, in this, hum, in my humble opinion, the, the prospects of rehabilitation of, of the offender, <clears throat> because when you examine, when one examine the the probation report and the psychologist report, the, the probation report was absent relative to, to any item of rehabilitation in it. They did not at all speak to rehabilitation. And I, I, my submission was, in, in essence then, that given it was anticipated that there would be a long custodial sentence on the appellant, that there was nothing hasty in, a, in requesting an addendum to the pre-sentencing report to examine whether or not the appellant would have been a fit candidate for rehabilitation and re-entering society. Furthermore, the psychologist's report did not speak to that aspect of rehabilitation. And if, if one follows the principles in, Hulk, in Hulkson, which I, I would have argued at the Court of Appeal, that there's nothing in the report that speaks to whether or not the appellant was a danger to society in the foreseeable future likely to commit acts similar in nature to the one for which he pleaded guilty. 
So there was not, there was, those, those things were absent. And, and F1 falls closely in school. And I was saying, I speak to the a psychiatric report. The question was even posed to the psychologist, and he indicated that, that, that it was organic, that that was not within his domain. So that there, there was nothing prevented the learning trial judge at that time from asking for a psychiatric report that, that, that could have been done because it was understood and appreciated that it would have been a long custodial sentence. Those, those were absent. So let me see if I could understand yes. you correctly. Yes. You say that the sentencer, the, the, the trial judge, that <laughs> sentence was deficient because it was based, first of all, on reports which were incomplete. The, 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 the precise report from the probation department spoke nothing at all. And that there was no psychologist. The psych well, the, 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 both Prison the probation and the psychologist's report were incomplete. That is, that, that is all respect for submission. And, and that the Court of Appeal was empowered, is empowered in law that in, in when, where there are deficiencies, they're authorized in law that they can, they can ask an order for a psychiatric report. That has been done before. And an addendum also to the presenting report as, as under the penal system reform act. The important law to so do is the case of, of Oliver Archer, where the court of appeal was dissatisfied with the presenting report and they are ordered an additional. Did, did you represent Arlene at the trial? No, no, I mean, I, I did not represent him at the trial. I only represented him at the, at the appeal. Did you represent him at the court of appeal? Yes, I did, Mila. Did you ask the Court of Appeal to have a new report done? I, I don't think I, I, I don't, if I check, I don't think I did. I, I spoke, I spoke about the deficiencies. That those were my grounds that I canvassed in, in my, in the appeal. I canvassed those grounds in relation to the absence of a psychiatric report, given what the psychologist, Ms. Um, Sean Pilgrim, has said in his report. Yeah, could we, could we stay on that point for a little while, yes, the, yes, the issue of um, <clears throat> rehabilitation? Um, I seem to recall, correct me if I'm wrong, that in imposing the sentence, um, Kentish J did remark on the fact that Seven your two. client ought to be enrolled in classes um, once he was in prison. 42, Mila, it is 42 of the record, Mila. You're confirming that she said I think, that? Yes, Miller, yes, I think it's... Okay. So I'm, I, I'm just a little puzzled by that because I assume that the purpose of those classes were to assist in his rehabilitation, in a sense? Miller, uh, rehabilitation as it relates to re-entering society or as it relates to the, the whole sentencing procedure as outlined by the penal system reformer. Because our act speaks to that a sentence of shall. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But, I, but, but I'm saying that, if, if that is the, I don't want to use the term singular aspect of it, mm -hmm. but it did not go, go in relation to whether or not he's someone fit to re-enter re society. Mm -hmm. not, notwithstanding that the, you, you said rehabilitation relative to that. Mm -hmm. It did not go beyond that. So the classes might have made him uh, a better person, uh, a more well-functioning individual, possibly, 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 but it did not speak to his um, reintegration into, into the society, society. Uh, which, were, which, were, which, but with the greatest respect, would have been covered by the pre-sentencing report of the probation department. Yes. Um, okay, I, I understand you. The other thing I wanted to ask is, is it, um, and this is along, along the lines that the president asked you earlier. Is the prospect of rehabilitation sufficient to exclude a person from the imposition of an indeterminate sentence? No, 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 Mila. I think all the, other, the, the gravity of the offense, the seriousness of the offense, all the factors, other factors have to be taken into account. I'm very much aware of that. Okay, good. Okay. So that there, there, there has to be a balance between the rehabilitative component, the deterrence component, the retribution component, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Mila. So in other words, you're saying that the judge could have come to the same decision 
even if there had been a report on the rehabilitation prospects of Iran. Yes, yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm agreeing with that. Mm -hmm. But in the absence of sex, sorry, sorry, you have to take into account the horrific nature of the crime. You've been stepping around that. I mean, basically, uh, Alain went from another person, the other person having a knife, to yes. rob this particular shop. Yes, yes, and Mr. Alain actually took with him two Molotov cocktails. Yes, Query whether arson must have been in mind. Yes. And they go in the shop, and he throws one Molotov cocktail down, he sees it set light to the inflammable clothes in the shop, and then as they leave, he throws another and Molotov yes. cocktail. Yes. And just, you know, six young women, you know, terrified of this knife man trying to escape, go and lock themselves in the back, yes, and, and they all die. And, listen, yeah. and in the psychologist's report, he said he didn't intend to start a fire. But what on earth did you think he's doing when he's throwing more, one mart of cocktail? I mean, to make it worse, throws another one. I mean, it's absolutely horrific. And, and six I, young lives have been listen, snuffed yeah. out. And listen, you know, I'm in agreement that the, that the crime was a heinous crime. We are, I'm not departing from that, from that land environment at all. Yeah, so it does deserve a, a, a severe sentence. That I am fully cognizant of that. I'm in total agreement that a long custodial sentence was, was always on the cards. I, I, I don't detract from that at all. What would you have considered to be a suitable sentence? A, 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 a quantifiable sentence, 30 years, you know, 25, 30 years. What is understood? in the judicial system and in the penal system in Barbados as being the range of years that would be spent on a life sentence? It could be 25, could be 30, or could be about that, I think, yeah. In certain instances, it's about 25, yes, in certain instances, 25 to 30. Well, isn't that exactly what you just proposed? He, he, might, have, he, might, have, he, might, have, he might have had that. But, 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 oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Mr. Hola, I, I just want to get about 20, uh, I believe 25 to 30 years yeah. might be deemed. Are, are you familiar with this? Yes, yes, no. Okay. Yes. I know, for instance, and I'm told that in Trinidad, life mm -hmm. is normally understood as being 15 to 20 years. In Belize, it is around the same thing. So I just want to get from you, and it is, it is certainly good. we will ask the director. Absolutely. Yeah. It's in Barbados, it is, is you, you, can, you can get 25 to 30 years. 25 to 30 years. Depending on, yes. Okay, right. And the, the whole review process, the section 42, the prison rules, and section 70, yes, depending on. Okay, thanks. So, so your problem is not so much that he would spend a long time in jail, and that he would receive 25 to 30 years at the end of the day. That is what he served. You're not too concerned with the number of years no, he's gotten. You're more concerned with the process that, is that the High Court judge right. used. I think I understand. Be because if, even if, if it was, for, for example, suppose you were given 25 to 30 years, for example, which is a determinate sentence, then, then based on the concept of the applicability of this count, ah. then that can be factored in. Mm. Because it is determinate in nature. But what, what has been gleaned from Paragraph 43 is that because it's quote unquote indeterminate, then there's no applicability of a discount at all. Mm. I suppose you don't get remission either when you serve a life sentence. But that is, what, well, yes, you, you can, you can. Section 42 will speak to that, but that is discretionary. That is discretion. Uh, uh, Section 42, every four years you're up for review. Right. Wow. So you're up for review every four years. No, but. But on the, 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 the Romeo Hall, depends. it depends. The nine months, the prison will speak to the, to the nine months being the prison year. Right. Yes, yes, so ma'am. But if you, have, if you have a life sentence, then um, you, you don't have any because years it, on which you get remission. Because, no, no, yeah. because it, it, it is indeterminate. Is indeterminate. Because it's not quantifiable. It's not quantifiable. So, so then you agree with me. Well, yes, ma'am. Right. So that, that the only help that you might get is section 70 of the Constitution, which then empowers the, the Governor General, the, the prerogative of mercy, etc. So, under the prison rules, every four years there when is. When you're sentenced to life imprisonment, yes, you, you are subject, you, yes, you are. And what's the purpose of the review? To, to see if you're fitting in, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to see. Fitting in where? In, in, in the, to see how your behavior, etc., is to see. If, if, 
then based on a number of reviews, one can then make, I think you can make an application to have your sentence, to, to have your sentence reviewed. You reviewed can, with you, a view to getting some. To, right, to get right, that. Remission. Yes, Miller. Okay. Yes. And that's section 78? 78 of the Constitution and 42 of the prison rules. Yeah. Let's speak to that. Then going, the bundle by going back to the remission, yes, yes um, is there remission in fact, in, in, in practice, if you have a life sentence? I, I, I not because it's not quantifiable. There, there is remission in relation to a determinate sentence. Yes, yeah, I know, but there wouldn't be in practice. In practice, no I, one I, would say, "Well, look, this man has been here, and when we count it." Yeah, you don't I, do that at all. No, no. Anyway, we'll ask. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Holland. Mr. Yes, Holland. Yes, yes, yes. I'm taking up from where my sister um, yes. had it just now. Surely it can't be the case that every person who has been sentenced to a life sentence yes, yes. has remained there for life. No, no, no. no right. no. So what is it that takes place? That, which, that, see, right. which sees them leave before they die. Before what takes place? Right. The, a, a continuous review of the four years, for example. Right. Yeah, that, that kicks in. Right. So the review process can end up with a remission. Years yes, it, it, it can. It so can. that even for a life sentence, there can be a period at which the prison authorities, the governor general, says that you have spent enough time, you are therefore now released on parole. Yes. The, or your sentence yes, is yes. commuted... Or that, whatever. That, is the, that is the section 78, which okay. is important. That gives the Governor General... Even the, the for an indefinite sentence, the possibility there can exists. be a... Huh? The possibility exists. Yes. That is yes. right. Well, sorry, not just a possibility, but it happens... Yes, it, yes, yes. Right, yes. okay, thanks. You can, you, you can be resentenced, yes. Yeah, all right, thank you. Is, is it possible then that, let's say, after three reviews, after 12 years, that um, in a case like this, I, Milad, I'm not, I've been around for a little while now and not after 12 years. Mm. You, you, you get it, you, you stand there, a distinct possibility. Um, the 20, uh, 20, 20 years on up, you, is a distinct possibility. 12 years is, is much too short. Mm. So, in the scheme of things. Mm. In the so, scheme of things, 16 would also be too short. Yes, Milad. Right, so. so if you if you are released <coughs> at the end of the 20 years, let us say, yes, or arguendo, um, are you released on, on license or, or parole, or you, or the, what happens? Not on parole. It's on, I think it's more on license. Are you free? Or unconditionally released. You're unconditionally released. Yeah, there's no parole act. They, we, we do not have, no. Right. There is no seeking to have, to, mm. to bring certain things into, into focus, actually. That is one of the things that... Okay, so your first ground of appeal is that the, the trial judge did not take into account... Well, the, the reports before the trial judge did not speak to the prospects of rehabilitation. Right. That is correct. Okay. What's the second ground? And it was more, it was more concerned with the deterrence and the punishment principle. And the, the second ground speaks to the, the discount, the, 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 the indeterminate sentence. Oh, yeah, I'll cover that. Which, which forms the, the, the crux, basically, of, 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 of the argument before this court. And in examining ground two, uh, Your Honors, I, I, I was particularly interested in, in the CCTA decision of 2018. The Prasad and the Queen matter, which in 2018, uh, CCJ 10 of 2018, which, which and you can look at, at which I, and I quote at paragraph 56 of the dicta from this honorable court. And you read, if you are leave, there are some policy reasons for a significant reduction of sentences, especially in the case of an early guilty plea. Such a plea is in the public interest as it avoids the need for a trial and save victims and witnesses from having to give evidence of often traumatic events, shortens the time between the charge and the sentence, and saves costs. Best sentencing practice suggests that the discount 
should be approximately one third for a guilty plea entered at the earliest possible opportunity, etc. And this speaks to the whole issue, which is at the heart of, of ground two. No, I don't think I don't think so. You see, the problem is that that case dealt with a determinate sentence. Understand, understand me, lad. Understand me, lad. So the question is, in what circumstances, if at all, yes, me, lad. can you argue for um, the reduction for the early guilty plea in relation to an indeterminate right. sentence? So, how, how do you how do you arrive, first of all, at the question as to whether an indeterminate sentence is appropriate. I think that's, that has to be the starting point. Because once you decide that a life sentence is appropriate, then it's difficult to see how you're going to operate the so, discount rule. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. That, that is why the crux of my argument has always been, and will be, whether in truth and in fact, in relation to an indeterminate sentence, in relation to an indeterminate sentence, whether a discount can move an indeterminate sentence to a determinate sentence. No, that's a circular argument. This is the point. <laughs> it's circular because the sentence, <clears throat> the sentence is arrived at after you consider the guilty plea and all other circumstances. So that it is after you consider all of these things, you decide, because this is not a mandatory life sentence regime. Listen, huh? This is a discretionary life sentence regime. And before the judge exercises her discretion to award an indeterminate sentence, the judge ought already to have taken into account the guilty plea. So the only way in which you can craft your argument is to suggest, as I think Justice Rajnath Lee was trying to steer you in that direction, is to suggest that this was not a proper case for a, an indeterminate sentence. sentence. But from the point, from, from starting off, <clears throat> starting off on the premise that this was an, an indeterminate sentence and therefore should then have factored the guilty plea is a wrong premise. I understand. But Mila, therefore the question, I'm then posing the question, because then my, obviously the, my argument must be and is that those factors were not taken into consideration in arriving at an indeterminate sentence. That the factors of mitigation in relation to the offender, for example, that they did not feature at all in, 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 in the judgment of the learned trial judge and the court of appeal in arriving. Sorry, what factors? The factors of mitigation? The, the factors of the, the yeah, the mitigation aspects of, in relation to the, to the offender. Um, it is my submission, therefore, that those were not adequately... Oh, adequately, because she yes, did, she did yes, mention no. them. Yes. She did mention all of those yes, mitigating yes. factors. I, I don't want to use the term in a fleeting glance, but they were, they were mentioned. Yeah, Mr. Hull, I thought it was useful that um, the Court of Appeal in its judgment at paragraph 21 mm -hmm. um, related your argument as a Hodgson, Hodgson yes. in that uh, and I think that is a useful starting point for you as to why the trial judge, in your view, ought not to have imposed a life sentence. But as I indicated to this Honorable Court earlier, given it was understood and appreciated that the appellant would be in, would be in custody for a long period of time, mm -hmm. that there, there, there was no need to hurry for a sentence. No, you're coming back to rehabilitation. No, 21 doesn't deal with that. No, 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 no the, the aspect of the, no, the psychiatric report is what I'm speaking of. Right, right. No. So you're coming back the medical, the, Mr. Mr. Hola, let me, yes. let me, let me share with you yes, my understanding of what it is that you were submitting. Um, I think your submission omits the word potential. Your submission is that in considering a potential life sentence, a judge should consider what impact an early guilty plea will have in deciding whether that potential life sentence should be settled upon and imposed. So what you are saying is that life imprisonment is on the table, it's under consideration in the judge's process, but in considering whether to go with life imprisonment and the judge indicated from early 
that I am considering life imprisonment, mm -hmm. the judge should have allowed herself to consider that if I impose life, then I will be denying this person the benefit of the early guilty plea. That, as I understand it, is your submission. Is that correct? I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your indulgence, yes. Well, she may not have expressed it in the way um, that you <laughs> might have, but it seems to me that those considerations were, you know, clear to the mind of the judge. She mentioned all of those things when she was when she when she decided that look, you know, an indeterminate sentence was appropriate. But, but then, but with the greatest respect, me like then if you examine the the, the dicta and the process as it relates to Hudson which speaks to a, a definitive process being undertaken in arriving at that. Even though, even though, yes, there are certain instances where a psychiatrist report might not be necessary. In certain instances, a medical report, yes, might not. But I'm saying that in the absence of a report where it is, it is patent that the psychiatrist report did not speak to any organic nature, for example, of of any psychiatry, et cetera, that, that a psychiatrist report was, was an essential component. <clears throat> if one follows the process as outlined in Hudson. Mm. That, that was an important variable that ought to have been utilized by the learned trial judge. And, and that it was still open, it was still open to the Court of Appeal to so order. Hudson refers to whether the defendant's history shows that he is of some unstable character. Likely to commit offenses offense similar in, in nature in the future. And, and you saying that is sorely lacking here? Right, and nothing was, the, the psychology did not speak to that. And, and, and this was, in essence, totally absent in relation to the sentencing remark of the learning trial judge. Didn't it come across that he is a danger to the public? Because it never crossed his mind that people might die as a result of throwing two Molotov cocktails. But, but, but Lord, that, that might have been a, a, a one-off event. A one-off event, me Lord. Because there's nothing that shows that he has a propensity to commit similar offenses in the future. Nothing. You had a clean record, right? Huh? Right. Um, Although the director hinted that that was a fiction. <laughs> Which was? Yes, was the, fi the fiction remains. Leave it there. Yes. Yeah. I, I, am, I am attracted to the point, and I think the judge took this point as well, that there was not an intention on his part that these six young ladies would have died in the fire. I think she said very clearly that she thought that he did not have that intention. But of course that he was clearly reckless in his, in his conduct. Um, do you make anything of that, 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 that difference between having an intention to cause death? And as it, that he has the mens he, had, he, he possessed the mens rea as it relates to, to, to robbery breaking anything, anything we saw, but, but clearly there was nothing that suggests that he had the man's way for murder. Mm. Can you tell us anything about his um, co-accused or co-conspirator? <laughs> I, 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 yes, I, I probably can, <laughs> because of, <laughs> well, he is, he's still, he is awaiting, I, he has appealed now, he, he was sentenced, um, he was sentenced to hang, he was, Right, he, so first he was convicted of murder, I think. The other person, yes. Right. So uh -huh. he, went, he went through the trial? Yes, he did. Okay. Convicted of murder and, and sentenced to hang. Yes, and he's now in the appeal process. And he's now in the process of... Yes, he has, uh, he has appealed that decision. So based on the very same facts, obviously a jury found that he had the appropriate mens rea. Yes, sir. Mm. Needless to say, sir, he was a self-represented accused mm. of anything dished all... Um, and not quite a number of prominent attorneys he would have. He was the one who had the knife. He wasn't the one who yes, threw the Molotov cocktail. That is so correct. Presumably it was a joint venture. Yes, that is correct. It was a problem for him. He would have um, but gotten rid of all the attorneys and he would have 
represented himself in the trial that lasted about three months, I believe. A very long, long trial. He represented himself? That's that, what that you is, said? That, that is correct. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. That All right. So, Mr. Holder, I think your two grounds of appeal are really one. You, you basically are saying, especially as you agreed to the way in which Justice Barrow put it, that the all the relevant circumstances that would impinge on a decision as to whether to give an indeterminate sentence, that um, many of those circumstances were not considered or were not sufficiently considered, namely the fact that he did not have previous convictions, that he was remorseful, that he was young, that the reports, the psychiatric report and the probation report were deficient in the sense that they did not speak to the prospects for rehabilitation, he pleaded guilty. Your appeal really is that all of these factors were such that if they were properly considered, the judge ought not to have determined that a life sentence should be imposed. Correct me, Lee. But you're not contesting that if a life sentence is imposed, there can be no discount for a guilty plea. But you accept that? Just, just to put it on the record. Me, me like a, 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 it's a difficult, it is a difficult proposition with aggressive respect, me like. Because, uh, because we, yes, I understand that it is, it is, it is not quantifiable, mm. that it is not quantifiable because it speaks to life. Mm -hmm. But, but it, what I'm, if, if one goes with that argument then, then there's no value, therefore, there's no value in relative to a guilty plea. Relative to any, any determined sense, there's no, it cannot be a value, there can't be any value to your discounting. Yeah, well, but if, if we, I think we have covered if it. If we set yeah. guidelines <clears throat> in relation to, to discount, which some other countries would have done, or enact legislation, then policy decisions might, 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 might prove otherwise. No, but you see, in reaction to what the President asked okay. you, yes, sir. you said that a, a guilty plea cannot necessarily yes, exclude yes. somebody from an indeterminate yes, sentence. Yes, that is correct, that is correct. Okay. So once you have decided that the internal sentence is appropriate, once you have decided yes, that, right. in your case you're saying it's not appropriate here. Correct, that is correct. Good. Right. But if we decide that it is appropriate in another case, some other case, then you agree yes, that right. you cannot have a discount. That is correct. Right. Right. That, that's all I'm trying to get from you. Yes, right. Right. And you would agree on the basis that it would have been determined to be appropriate because before it was so decided, all the factors would have been considered. Ought to have been considered. Right. Ought yeah. to have been considered well, yeah. appropriately or adequately considered. Mm. Yeah, we yes. Yes. Um, yes, right. yes. yes. You, you mentioned as well that you, you thought that if he had gotten a determinate sentence, he would have gotten around 25 to 30 yes, years. Yes. That was yeah. the end result or the starting point? That would have been, the, the, that, that would have been the starting point. Started. Yes. So yeah, you you had then to factor in a discount for an early guilty plea, early remorse, guilty mitigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you're bringing it down to probably 50, probably over 15. Yes. And utilizing the guidelines, the peer law guidelines, which are in need of of revisiting, etc. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are the need to be revisited ASAP as early as possible. Mm -hmm. How much do you factor in the? Um, the attitude of the public of Barbados in a sentence such as that for a crime which had these consequences. That was a determining factor, the public interest. Without doubt in a small society, closely knit society, that would have been that would have been a factor that would have loomed very, very large in the determination of an appropriate sentence. Yes, that obviously is no, what I'm asking you, do you think that fifteen years would have been consistent with a proper regard for those public... Two and a half interests. years for each life? Uh, it might, no, it, no, it probably would not have been. It probably would not have been. It would not have been? It would not have been given the fact that six persons would have died. Right. That, that, that was a, a, determ a critical factor, the death of six young, young women, yes, that was a, a critical factor. Tell me something. Um, <clears throat> now, although he got concurrent sentences, which was the proper thing to do. In your view, would a sentence be aggravated by the fact that there are multiple fatalities? Mm 
you don't want to answer that one. It's a very difficult, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a difficult <laughs> question, Mila, to answer. It is a, it is a very... Privilege against self-incrimination. <laughs> yes, it is, it, is, it is a very difficult question to answer, Mila. It, it, yes, it, it is an aggravating feature. It is an aggravating factor. We cannot get away from that. Yeah, but you see, so why can't we consider that the judge perhaps regarded that feature to be of such aggravation that it outweighed Once, yeah. the factors which you mentioned and which were very important factors, the no previous convictions, youth, the guilty plea, and so on. I, I, I understand that, Mila, but I don't know. know if I, well, notwithstanding that, my question still remains whether adequate consideration was given to the other factors. As I said, we cannot underplay and underscore that it was a heinous crime in which six persons lost their life. That, that is important. I will not de de seek to diminish that. But it has to be weighed against all the other variables. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, I, I think we, we, we've mm -hmm. gotten your arguments, Mr. Holder. Unless the court wishes to hear me for them, those are my respectful submissions. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Blackman, is this? Please, this honorable court, the respondent relies on the submissions which were filed, and I'm sure that your honors had the opportunity of reading those submissions. Having said that, I would just like to respond to some certain submissions which were made by my learned friend. Sorry, before you do that, with the president's permission, could you um, just clarify the inquiry from the bench as to what is normally understood as being a range of years that would be served on a life sentence? Yes, I will. I did have it make a note, but I'll do it right away. Okay. In, in Barbados, there is no legislation to suggest what is actually a life sentence. Right. Life in Barbados simply means life. Right. In some jurisdictions, as you, the Honorable Mr. Barrow, did indicate, there, there is legislation which tells you exactly what is life insofar as a sentence is concerned. It is, as you said, in Belize, and there's also legislation in Bermuda, which simply tells you a life imprisonment is 25 years or 30 years. Mm -hmm. However, in Barbados, there is no legislation, there is no practice direction. Yeah, the question is, though, what, what is, as a matter of practice, what life takes is life. place? Life is life. So nobody, or virtually nobody who has been sentenced, to life imprisonment is released early? Well, to answer you, my, 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 Your Honor, this is where Section 78 and, section, and Rule 42 of the prison rules will be considered. Hmm. Because as my friend did point out, and as we cited, um, the prerogative, prerogative of mercy is entitled to have, to, to review a person's sentence mm -hmm. after four years. Right. And once you've served four years, it does not matter whether it's a determinate mm -hmm. or an indeterminate sentence. Mm -hmm. Once that first review has been made, it follows thereafter that reviews can follow twice a year, three times a year, depending on the application that is made on behalf of that person <clears throat> for that sentence to be reviewed. So the initial, the initial period must be four years. And after four years, that sentence can be reviewed at yeah, any we, time. We have that clear, um, Mr. Yes, yes, Blackman, but yes. I'm just asking as a practical matter. Yes, my Lord. Um, a, a prison officer, for instance, who has been serving in a prison for, let's say, 40 years, can tell any young lawyer who visits that boy, when they say, um, life, these fellows here, they're not getting out before 20 years. 
or they're not getting out before 12 years. So there is a practice. It happens in reality. It does not matter whether legislation exists or not. So I'm trying to get from you a sense of what the public, for instance, the informed public in Barbados would understand when told that somebody has been sentenced to life imprisonment. What would the public reasonably understand by that? The public would reasonably understand that if you're sentenced to life imprisonment in Barbados, that is, that is the sentence. You're there for your life. But you will not be released before. You won't be released before. Yes. But you can be released based on um, the prison rule number 42 okay. and uh, the prerogative of mercy. You can be released. You don't know That's how often. I know it's how not often. usual. So basically most are released between 60 and 20 years. 18, 18 to 20 years. That has happened. We have we had some very heinous crimes in Barbados, as a matter of fact, um, where I'm not giving evidence. I'm just like in the court, right. where a gentleman threw some dynamite into a house because he was in a relationship with this lady, and he thought that she had betrayed him, and that was a horrific crime in Barbados. And after serving, I think it's about 22, 23 years. He was released okay. by the, by the um, commission. And so there are instances when it can happen based on the, the application and certainly... As a matter of curiosity, is that, is that a reported case? I think it is, it is a reported case. If you remember the name, could you... Just send a note to the registrar yes, if you don't. I will. Thanks. Yes, um, Mr. Papan, the Rule 42, mm. it says that the review sh shall take place by the Governor General mm. at uh, four yearly intervals or shorter periods. Uh, is there a subsequent rule that tells us what can happen on the review? I just have up to 42. Is there anything else that assists what, what can the Governor General do on the review? Yes. Once the review has been done, well, then recommendations will be made to the Governor General based on having reviewed the matter, <coughs> having had discussions with the individual, having had reports from within the prison in terms of how that person is conducting or has been conducting him or herself. But then a decision will be made as to whether or not that person is really on the road for rehabilitation. Okay, so you go to 78 of the exactly. Constitution. Yes, I, yes, I follow you. Yes. So they, they both work, um, work together. Who does the review? There is a committee that is set up to do the, under the prison rules, and they would do the review and make the recommendations to the government general. You have an idea who is on the committee? What do you mean? Do you know who is on the committee? Um, it's a cross-section of persons. There is um, there's a minister of religion. There is a person from the, from the private um, private sector and uh, there are one two other persons i didn't really reset it because my friend did not um file any any submissions in, in response to my submissions I know, yeah. so I, I did not go to that extent but the composition is dictated by by what by are there supplementary rules or subsidiary rules it it just the, the committee was formed um pursuant to the the same rule the same prison rules um, and it has been, been practiced there for quite some time. As a re in regards to the basis, the legal basis for it, I, I am not sure what that is, but we know that it has been in practice for quite some time. And uh, mm -hmm. it is, in fact, part of the, of the, um, of the statute that deals with the Prisons Act. So there were rules that were made subsequent to the Prison Act, which mm -hmm. authorized um, this committee to function. Because the sort of questions uh, that have been asked, I think, are very, very useful in our deliberating on this case because we need to know, as a matter of fact, what is the likelihood of, um, is it Mr. Aleen, serving uh, a sentence and how long that sentence would be in prison if it's a matter of life, if he gets a term of life imprisonment. So, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think it's a very, very important um, issue. So there must be records, surely, of the um, reports from the committee or of the decisions of the Governor General on this point. Yes. They're, they're, are they not? They, they must be. Um, but the question is, Your Honor, is whether or not um, those, those records are made public. I believe you ah. would have to request them. 
you have to request them because those, those records um, would not be made um, public. Mm -hmm. I can say that for sure. Mm -hmm. One would then have to request them through the, the, um, the person who is in charge of the prison mm -hmm. on the letter. Mm -hmm. then, so they would not be made public, you mean they would not be published? But it is not, that is, it's that's not that they are secret. That is correct, that is correct. Would not be published, that is correct. Yes. But they, would, they can be requested um, through the, the, the office of the Governor General. Mm -hmm. And the reports that would be considered um, in the prison, those would have to be requested through the, the person who is in charge of the prisons. Mm -hmm. And once that is done, I think it, they are available. Because that information sorry. might be might be uh, handy in case the government of Barbados decides to enact legislation along the lines that you mentioned earlier. So that kind of information, I think, uh, is useful not just to a court, but perhaps also to the legislature. Yes. Um, has there been any judicial review or, or actions to um, have judicial review of the recommendations of the committee to the GG? That, that was done, Your Honor, in relation to a string of cases we had in Barbados where persons were sentenced to um, the term until, your, until His Majesty's or your, until Her Majesty's pleasure is known. There was a big discussion coming out of the case Mormon Scantabury. Um, and as a result of that discussion, the statutes in Barbados were amended where reference was made to Her Majesty's pleasure. And that has been replaced by the, until the court's court. pleasure yeah. is known. Yes. And simply that was because there was a successful argument in relation to the doctrine of the separation of powers. Where it was argued that if the Governor General is to decide how long a person remain in prison, what he's actually doing is determining the sentence of that person Correct. rather than the court. So that was changed, that has been changed. So there has been um, some amendment to this section, which now makes it easier to understand. Um, because the argument really is that in this particular case, mm -hmm. if we ask whether or not Section 78 and, such, and Rule 42 can be applied, the difference is that in this case, the Governor General is not having a rehearing of the sentencing process. Mm -hmm. That was determined by the court. Mm -hmm. The court having considered all the factors that were before it, all the information that was there, the aggravating factors, the mitigating factors, the pre-sentencing report, the psychologist report, the victim impact statement, which is now part of our penal system reform act is a requirement, and certainly offense seriousness, which in Barbados is considered to be a grave factor or important factor in determining the length of sentence that a court would really impose. Mm -hmm. And offense seriousness is also part of our penal system reform act. In relation to offense seriousness, um, I'm sure that your honors read um, our submissions and what we attempted to do to show that in other jurisdictions, offense seriousness is also a crucial ingredient. And we invited the court to consider cases um, from Canada and cases from Australia as it relates to that. If we go back... What I was trying to get at though is, is that if Mr. Aline was in prison pursuant to the sentence imposed, for let us say 24 years, let us say, assuming that um, nothing else happened to displace that sentence. Um, could, he, could he seek some judicial redress to say, well, look, this committee has been looking at my case. Um, you know, what have they said to the Governor General has not re uh, resulted in my release. You know, I want to have some, some review. Yes. Is, is that possible? Well, he'll be entitled to, to to file to ask for judicial review. If he's of the view that, despite the fact that he has had reviews mm. and his matter is not being treated favorably, but certainly he can approach the court um, either on a constitutional point mm. or simply ask him for judicial review. But yes. once he has done four years, like I said, whether it's determined or not, well then he, is, he can still benefit from Rule 42 and that section which gives the Governor General the authority. The black man, in that same vein, would it be um, imposing too much to ask you to collaborate with Mr. Holder, Mr. Holder to give the registrar some indication as to what has been the treatment 
of life um, sentenced persons over, let's say, the last 10 years or so? Not a difficult team, I'm prepared. I'm prepared to do that to assist this honorable court. Yeah. And Mr. Hola, I have every confidence will cooperate with you. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, Mr. Blackman, the, yeah. as I understand it, the nub of the appellant's argument, which I would like you to respond to, is that in determining the life sentence, the judge paid no or no sufficient regard to the peculiar issues that relate to the offender, namely the lack of previous convictions, the level of remorse, his youth, that in particular the reports before the judge failed to establish that he had a propensity to commit this kind of crime mm -hmm. and that he pleaded guilty. Yes, well, yes. well I suppose I will answer by starting by making a reference to the um, case of Hobson, which sets out the three um, criteria in relation to the imposition of life sentences. Just quick and quick look at the, the head note, um, Your Honours. It says, a, life sent a sentence of life imprisonment is justified when, one, the offence or offences are in themselves grave enough to require a very long sentence. Two, it appears from the nature of the offences, or, this is important, or from the defendant's history that he is unstable and likely to commit such offences in the future. And three, if the offenses are committed, the consequences to others may be especially injurious, as in the case of sexual offenses or crimes of violence. My friend submitted that the judge was erred when she did not request um, information or report as it relates to the, the, the stability or the instability of the now appellant in terms of whether or not it was likely for him to commit similar offenses in the future. It is our submission that the case of, of, of Hobson says you can either go on the nature of the offenses, which is embedded in our offense in our penal system reform act, or from the defendant's history that he's unstable and likely to commit such offenses in the future. When the learned trial judge was reviewing the information before her, she made specific reference to the report of Mr. Sean Pilgrim as it related to the, the, um, the appellant. And she also made reference to a question that was posed then by the learned director and the response that Mr. Pilgrim gave in relation to whether the, there was a possibility that the now appellant was capable or likely to commit offenses of this in the future. Grateful. Yes. Um, I'd like to invite your, your Honour's attention to what we have from line three, the question, the answer from this program. One of the main features of a depressive disorder is distortions in the individual's interpretation of reality. In, a, in essence, they see things in a worse way than they really are intended to be. Question right, answer. They are overtly pessimistic and their thinking lends support to their sadness as a sense. Okay. And as a result, their actions can become rather unpredictable. The answer, yes, they can. 
and then the question, and since his actions can, rather, can be rather unpredictable, he would pose a danger not only to himself but to the wider society? Sorry, 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 sorry. That verb yes. is not would. And it makes every difference. Like for could. He it's could. He could. Uh, yes, indeed. He could. He could. That's not correct. would. Yes, he could. He could pose a danger, uh -huh. not only to himself, but to the wider society. And the answer was, without the necessary treatment, absolutely. Yeah, but you see, it, <laughs> it years can't old. be mm -hmm. that you would take every person who suffers from moderate or severe depression and say that that person has a propensity to commit arson or to commit um, manslaughter. That, 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 that can't be right. That's correct. So that, that is why, my, my, Your Honor, I made reference to the, to the principles criteria noted in, in Hobson, which says that you can go on offense seriousness or you can have, it, have, can have evidence mm -hmm. as it relates to whether the person is stable or unstable. And certainly, um, as I did indicate, and I'm sure Your Honors had, had the opportunity to read the, the section from our offenses, our Penal System Reform Act which speaks um, specifically to offense seriousness and how that can be used based together with all the other Sorry, you, you, you're switching to offense seriousness, which is a strong yes, indeed. footing for you, yes, but you are switching. Um, the question, no, the question is the likelihood yes, that this person would be a danger to society. So we dealt with could, would, the president mentioned propensity, mm -hmm. etc. But it seems to me, and I'm completely open, it seems to me that there's not anything which says that this man is presently a danger because he is likely, or it is a well-founded apprehension that he would commit this sort of offense again. Yes. I, I must agree with, with Your Honor because it's not in the record. Um, that is why I... I okay. I invited the, the Honorable President mm. to, to consider um, criteria two um, from the Hudson, which says it appears from the nature of the Okay. No, wait, 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 wait. The second condition yes, essentially is that the guy is unstable and likely to commit such offenses in the future. Now, how do you establish that? You establish it from the nature of the offenses or from his history. So, in this particular case, are you suggesting that because of the nature of the offense, he's likely to commit a similar offense in the future? Because I will extend it. To, to include, because that in itself is a requirement for specific um, information as it relates to the stability or instability of the individual. I, I would just, um, in answer, I would, I would say that based on what's before this court and what is in the record, it does appear that offense seriousness was a crucial ingredient, and that was oh, wait, considered. Wait, wait. I, I, mm -hmm. I have a different view yes, from you on the second limb. Yes, because where there is the preposition or, it, 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 that's not disjunctive from the rest of it. It is not that it appears from the nature of the offenses and then you say, well, okay, that's about the seriousness of the offenses. No, the nature of the offenses <clears throat> relates to instability and the likelihood to commit such offenses in the future. So that if you are harping on the nature of the offense, you must do so with a view to be able to establish that from the nature of the offense, he's unstable and likely to commit such offenses in the future. Do you understand me? Yes, I'm with you. If I may add to the President's um, statement there, Mr. Blackman, just from what um, your associate has on the on the screen. His head in one is seriousness. Yes. We are talking in Hudson about offences, which is to say, where this person was convicted of two um, counts of 
rape and burglary and other assault on women. Yeah? So this is conduct, repeated conduct in this case. Rapes and burglary on women. So it appears from the nature of the offenses that he would be likely to commit them in future. He did it serially in the past. In this case, one grossly stupid act has caused this dastardly, inflammatory consequence. But does that mean that he had a history of firebombing places? Or that he's likely to firebomb if released in 30 years or whatever? I, I must agree with, with your honor because Okay. So, so, so primarily, Mr. Blackman, you are relying on the first heading then in the Hodgson case. The offense or offenses are in themselves grave enough to require a very long sentence. That is correct, Your Honor. And, 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 and so, as far as you're concerned, one, two, and three there in the head note are disjunctive. They're not cumulative. That is correct. But that that's is. not what the Court of Appeals said. Yeah. The Court of Appeals said that all three conditions had been met. Yes. And, These and conditions the, were cumulative in nature. Right. Yes. I think well, uh, that, you, yes. That was, that was their... The, the, and the, and the, the head note says it, because yes. before three, there is the and. Yes. <laughs> the head note says it, eh? Yes. yes. So we have one, two, followed by a, an and, mm -hmm. then they are conjunctive, cumulative. I, I must, I must accept that. Okay, I must accept that. But of course, it's not a statute, right? It's a, <laughs> yes. it's a case from a, from the UK, and they're reading from the head note, so I, I wouldn't. Uh, but, uh, it's the yeah. Mr. Um, that one is this uh, Hodgson a, a case, which has been followed by, in in Bobby, right? of course, regularly I, and uh, without any objection or without any um, amendment, then or <laughs> that, that's adjustment. Yes, ma'am. As pointed out in, in our submissions, it was followed in um, Robert Maloney, the plane, which is, which is at paragraph 10 of my submissions, and Maloney is at tab 4. It was followed, but a matter of fact, it was considered the principles were discussed in the Oral Cummings, in Oral Cummings and the Queen, um, which is at tab 5. So, so there, there is precedent in Barbados for the application of the principles um, enunciate, enunciated in, in Hobson. And uh, as pointed out in those, in those judgments, um, the, the, court, the Court of Appeal is of the view that offense seriousness, and I keep stressing this, I know what the Mr. President um, pointed out, and I know what Honorable Justice Barrow um, pointed out. But in Barbados, which offense seriousness is, is such a, uh, a very important, such an important ingredient, mm -hmm. um, it is recognized to be so in the Penal System Reform Act. And uh, Oral Cummings, and indeed there's another matter which I did not cite, the case of, um, uh, we refer, his name will come back to him, we refer to him as the deadbolt man, this Canterbury. Nicholas Canterbury. Offense seriousness was also considered in that case. That is where um, the appellant entered the business establishment of a lady in the night. She heard a noise. She, in an effort to see what was happening to her business, she appeared and was unfortunately shot, and she was fatally shot. And but he intended to shoot her, right? Well, he, he, well, he did what he did. I, I guess he did. Um, and, and he and that was determined in relation to um, the seriousness of the offense as well. At that time, it was just Ms. the Chief Justice was Mr. Dennis Williams. And in Oral Cummings, the learned Chief Justice then, Mr. David Simmons, he also made a reference to offense seriousness. And he made it clear that there will be cases from time to time where there is no requirement to have evidence of a person's stability 
or instability as it relates. No, I, I was going in a different direction. You yes, see, sir. because the case you mentioned just now um, involved, I assume, an intent, an intent on the part of the assailant to shoot or defend the person. Yes. Now, what bothers me in this case is that the judge did say in her judgment that there was no intent on the part of Mr. Aleen um, for these six young ladies to be burnt in, in the back of the store. So when you talk about offense seriousness, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand, are you talking about the consequences of the offense or are you talking about the, the moral turpitude of the offender? or both? I'm talking, um, Your Honor, in relation to all the, the, the circumstances surrounding the, the, this event. First of all, we have to look at the planning, whether it was premeditated. We go back and we look at the planning. We look at the approach to the execution of this plan. They were properly armed. They, they, had, they knew what, they were, yeah. what the intention was. They went to rob. Certainly they went to rob. Mm. They had masks. They had a lighter. Why would they have a lighter and you have Molotov cocktails? What are you going to do? With no, that no, I, I don't think anybody discussed that. No, I'm just that. making the point. Yes. To show yes. To, to your thing, as it relates to intention. It is true that the judge, the learned trial judge, the sentencing judge, did in fact make that statement. Yes. But as we know, intention can be inferred from all the circumstances of a particular case. No, but she made a, she made a particular statement yes, about the intention, that. which I, I think we have to that. accept. Yes, I can't get away from that. Yes. So I must admit that that is on the record. Yes. I must accept that. So that would make it a little different from the case you mentioned about the person going into the store that and shooting the shop. That is correct. Um, I, I asked Mr. Holder a question. Uh, I was a little surprised at his answer, and I wanted to get your take on it as well. Um, if the nature of the offense, well, can the nature of the offense be so horrific um, that a consideration of rehabilitation cannot take the sentence uh, out of the realm of an indeterminate sentence? Um, so here we have a, a, a chap who was 20 years at the time and all the mitigating factors that we know about, and possibly the prospect of rehabilitation. Right? Um, in fact, even from the record you read earlier, it said that with treatment, yes, even the instability of the personality could have been, could have been uh, salvaged. So let's assume that there's a possibility of rehabilitation. Um, does that prospect mean that an indeterminate sentence is inappropriate? Or can you impose a life sentence even though there is good prospects of rehabilitation? Yes. In relation to the first um, question, in, in, I'd just like to go back to, to, to say that in this particular case, I, have, I heard what you said. We're looking at a discretionary sentence that was imposed. No, no, no. It's not about the possibility of his rehabilitation. It's about what is the sentencer to do um, if um, is is the fact that there is no or put it this way: can the nature of the, the my colleague is asking, can the nature of the offence be so horrific that the, the, the nature of the offense takes it out of the realm of a determinate sentence. I would answer that. Mm. Notwithstanding any and all powerful mitigating factors, it, it is possible that an offense could be so ghastly, so terrible, that 
the most powerful mitigating circumstances would still not be sufficient to render it less than an indeterminate sentence. That's your argument. Yes, but isn't that a mandatory sentence? It's, it's not, it's not mandatory. It's no. no, your answer to the president does not amount to a mandatory sentence. You're saying the nature of the offense is such that the only appropriate sentence in this case is a life sentence. So it's not a mandatory sentence. No, but I'm, I'm trying to understand what you were saying. I thought that's exactly what you were saying. So all of these other mitigating factors have no influence at all once the offense is of a certain nature. Yeah, and, and these questions are not meant to be any kind of criticism at all. They're just trying to explore, explore with you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is um, the, the idea of life imprisonment. Um, because when we heard from your colleague earlier, he suggested a, a number of years, which might in fact equate to the time that this chap will serve if he's given a life sentence. It is certainly possible. So what I'm asking you then is, is there any difference between those two situations? On the one hand, the person's given a life imprisonment, but gets out after, let us say, 20 years, for argument's sake. On the other side, he's given um, 27 years. He gets a discount for early guilty plea, for a clean record, remorse, etc., and he comes out after 20 years. Is there any difference between those two sentences? Um, and would any difference respond to any public interest in the sentence that is imposed? Yeah. yeah, perhaps very clumsily, what I'm trying to get at is, is there any psychological benefit to the society in having the accused sentenced to life imprisonment? Um, we, we take a 15 minute break at this point and then we'll hear the balance of your submissions. Court rise.
Yes, Mr. Black. Thank you. Yes, grateful, Your Honor. Yeah. 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 Your Honor, in, in relation to um, my friend's submissions and uh, the engagement of this honorable court, there, there was, in fact, the report of the psychologist's report from Mr. Sean Pilgrim, which was actually before, before the court. And uh, in the sentencing remarks, the learned, the sentencing judge did in fact make reference to certain aspects of that report. We filed that report at tab 19, and it's up before this on the court on the screen. And I would like invite this honorable court's attention to the paragraph that begins with A and goes to a number of aspects. Is this court with me? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And this, in, in our view, was before the, in our submission, was before the sentencing judge. And this was what um, some of the findings of, the, of Mr. Pilgrim. And he said a number of aspects of Mr. Pilgrim's self-description suggest. So what, what, what page is that? Um, Page 819. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. A number of aspects of Mr. Ali's self description suggest noteworthy peculiarities in thinking and experience. It's likely that he experiences unusual perceptual or sensory events, as well as unusual ideas that may induce magical thinking or deep, may include magical. Right. include magical thinking or personal beliefs. His thought process, processes are likely to be marked at times by confusion, distractibility, and difficulty concentrating, and he may experience his thoughts as blocked, withdrawn, or somehow influenced by others. Consequently, he may have some difficulty establishing close interpersonal relationships. In this page. At page... It, it twenty. The paragraph beginning with paragraph five of of with the word of. Yes. Of concern are his scores on behavioral coping and personal superstitious thinking skills. The behavioral coping skill indicates that that tendency of a person to automatically think in ways that facilitate effective action. Ms. Aline's score falls in the moderately low range. This score suggests that Mr. Aline does not usually consider problems in a manner which allows him to solve problems effective, effectively. Should be effective. The honors, it, it is our submission, and the learned sentencing judge did make reference to this report, that this is what the sentencing judge had before her. This is no criticism of my learned friend who appeared before the Honorable Court of Appeal. There was no request for any additional information to assist the sentencing judge. This is what the sentencing judge had before her. She had this report, she had the pre-sentence report, which I would say does not really, did not really deal with the, the whole aspect of his, of his rehabilitation in any meaningful way. In addition to these reports, the sentencing judge heard submissions from, from counsel who appeared for the then appellate. And as a matter of fact, I'm sure that this honorable court read our submissions. And in those submissions, counsel who appeared then at the sentencing hearing was supportive of the indeterminate sentence. And she did express the view that such a sentence would, of great, would be of benefit to the then appellate. 
Um, you have to be careful there, Mr. Black. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Because it seems to me that counsel objected at the outset to the indication from the DPP that he was asking for life imprisonment. So the thrust of Mr. Pierce's submission was, I accept it will be a long sentence. Mm -hmm. But she did not accede by so doing to a life imprisonment sentence. I was of the other view that that she did, she did, she did not oppose it because, uh, Your Honor, in Barbados there is a practice where if you're going to ask the court to consider imposing a life sentence, you must duly give notice to, to the appellant if he is unrepresented and certainly to his counsel mm -hmm. so that they can prepare for the submissions and be in a position to respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. What happened in this case at that stage, it was not clear um, as to whether or not the learned director was going to ask for the indeterminate sentence. And I think at that stage, there was some resentment in relation to whether or not it should have been requested. However, I'm of... Is no, my... No. No? Um, the learned director, in response to indications with the back and forth, mm -hmm. said, let me go on record as indicating yes, it is. I will be asking for a life yes. imprisonment sentence. Yes. After, after there was... Yes. Yes. So, so, so the, he, made, he made his presentation, yes. and then Mr. Pisa made hers, yes, indeed. not <laughs> concurring. Yes. She did not agree that it should be life. Yes. But she, she did express the view, um, I stand corrected, but I thought I read where she said, that it would have been benefit um, to the, that such a sentence would be a benefit to the then appellant. So which, such a sentence being what? A life sentence? A life sentence. Show me that. At page 891. Uh -huh. um, in those circumstances, ma'am, he is in the hands of the court in terms of sentence. I do not fall on one side or that except to say that the possibilities under life sentence are better than a lengthy sentence although under a life sentence, it's expected that there will be a lengthy sentence in the event, but he is young. Right. Mm. So, so she did not... I do not, I do not fall on one side or the other. Yes. She yes. was diffident. Yes. And, she, <laughs> and, and, and I, think she, I think she anticipated what was coming. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But I'm more concerned with what she said, um, or that except to say that the possibilities under life sentence are better. Uh -huh are better yeah. than a life sentence, than a, a determinate sentence. So, so it's my submission that even at that stage, there, there, there was no real, and this is all respect, of course, to counsel who appeared. Mm -hmm. there, there was no real challenge in my submission to, to the, the sentencing judge favorably considering imposition of a life sentence, of an indeterminate sentence. Okay. In relation to the, the um, exchanges earlier, it is our submission that notwithstanding the fact that there were mitigating factors, because there were mitigating factors, but it is our submission that the aggra aggravating features of this particular case outweighed those mitigating factors. And, and based on what was before the sentencing judge, who considered, as, as she said, as she said in her sentencing remarks, and, and as um, Honorable Mr. Anderson said earlier in the exchanges with my learned friend, on the record, it is there that she considered them. The question is, to what extent did she consider them? She mentioned, I think she, that's what um, my brother said, not that she considered. She, she, she mentioned, mentioned. Yes. Yeah. So, so if, if those are mentioned, mm -hmm. is it unreasonable for, for us to submit? 
that there is no reason having mentioned them that she considered them in coming to her decision. The answer to that is yes, it would be unreasonable because there are cases which make very plain that mentioning something and giving proper weight yes. to them is something completely different. But I, I, I accept your, your, your honor, your honor's decision. Um, however, in this particular case, the circumstances of this case, the fact that it's on record, um, how else was she supposed to, to do it? Was she supposed to itemize them and said, well, look, I gave X amount of weight to this one, Y amount of weight to the other one? In, in, in the end, I'm just... Counsel, just, just to respond very quickly to you, I'm looking at page 898. Yes, I'll find it here, please. The sentencing remarks. Yes, sir. Made by the judge. Yes, sir. I find some mitigating factors, yes. and they are your guilty plea, your early guilty plea, your clean record, your cooperation with the police in the investigation of this matter, and the fact that you are now only 22 years old, that was corrected to 20, etc. Yeah? Yes, well, Your Honor. So what consideration did she give? Did she say that um, an, early, an early guilty plea would normally entitle you to consideration of a one-third reduction in your sentence? Your Honor, I, I would respond um, by answering this way. This was not a determinate sentence. And we know the principles, as were enunciated by this honorable court in, in coming out of the Tiraf Prasad case. We, we know how, the, 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 um, how the, the sentencing judge should approach the sentence, arrive at a notional sentence, and then balance and come to a decision. In this case, based on the fact that the judge, it was clear from, from having gone through all of this, that the judge was of the view that based on what was before her, an indeterminate sentence was appropriate. So, so therefore, if you're going to give an indeterminate sentence, the question is, how will she factor in, or how would a judicial officer factor in a, 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 um, a discount for that's, that's a question which has been discussed, yes, and we've had the responses to that. Yes, Your Honor. But the point is, I was making, that she mentioned, but that she did not give weight to these. And it seems that your response is that consistent with her having decided it was a life imprisonment sentence, then there was no need for her to go into any discussion as to the impact that these factors could have because they cannot diminish a sentence of life imprisonment. Uh, so that is what happened here. Okay. I see, I see your, Lord, your, worship, your honorable um, opinion. But I, I, I do think at 901, 901. She, she does seem to su suggest that the mitigating factors are outweighed by the um, by the gravity of the offense. So regrettably, <coughs> neither the cooperation of the police, etc., etc. You have it there. Yes, page like four. Yes. So I suppose one can say that she 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 did balance up the um, the respective aggravating and mitigating factors. factors. The question is whether she gave sufficient, she placed sufficient value on one or the other. Well, the defense is, the appellant is saying that she didn't give sufficient consideration to the mitigating factors. Um, Counsel, following on from what the president said, yes, the same passage which he read, I was quite struck by this breadth of her statement. Um, regrettably, neither of these things, and then skip, is sufficient to detract from or neutralize in any way whatsoever. So these can't detract from in any way whatsoever the gravity? Yes. Is, that, is that really a, a, a balanced statement? It cannot detract from in any way this horrible offense. Your Honor, it seems to me that it was clear that offense seriousness and the element of deterrence um, 
were, were very prominent in the same oh, we, 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 That, <laughs> you, you don't have to mention, that yes, is indeed. manifest. And, yeah. and yes, hence the, but the, 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 the to, to say that it cannot detract from it in any way, really? Well, Your Honor, that, that was the, the, the expression of the sentencing judge, having had what she had before her. Yeah. And, and we know that she was, um, this is a, a, a discretionary but, sentence. But so the, 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 question, the, the question for you, Councillor, yes, is, Your Honor. Quite simply, as a matter of a judicial determination, to say that these things can have no weight, they cannot detract in any way? Your Honor, or or I, was she talking about the sentence? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought I would say that she was referring to the, the, the total circumstances mm. of it, and then okay. um, that aspect of it. We should go on to say, and the senseless and callous and horrific manner in which these six young women met their tragic and untimely deaths. That's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Mm. So you must have been speaking about this case and this case only. Yes, indeed. Yeah. indeed. You see, what bothers me is that um, until we know what life means yes. in terms of a sentence, there's an air of artificiality about all of this. You know, because um, if life means that Mr. Lean will serve, let us say, 20 years, um, that might come back to what a determinate sentence would Indeed. have been anyway. Indeed, I'm with you, Your Honor. Right, so I, I think we need some further and better information. Yes. And yes. I, I think you're promised yes, along I, with Mr. Holder to supply. Yeah. Mr. Barrow, okay. the indication. I will work with my colleague and we will try to get this information to this okay. honorable court. Um, Very good. Perhaps within a three week period because we'll have to um, have a meeting with persons sitting on the prerogative, prerogative of mercy and also to find out those members who sit on the committee, as was requested by this honorable court. So perhaps if this court gives us about three weeks, we should be in a position to assist this honorable court. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And I would have thought that's the kind of information that the office of the DPP might very well do well to have. Indeed, uh, indeed yes. that is correct. In yeah. light of the, the pending statutes and the intentions it's of exactly. all these amendments exactly. to our legislation. Okay. Yes, is there anything else? No, no, Your Honor. We said we rest on our, our submissions and the exchanges that we had with this honorable court. Yes. Uh, Just to you. give us some more information about the, um, the constitutional bill yes. that was mentioned earlier. We were told that it failed in the Senate? That is correct. Okay. Sorry, and this is, this is when? <clears throat> this when? When did that failure in the Senate November? take place? Three? Yes, Your Honor, Yes, quite recently. Yes. yes. Obliged. Yes. So the, the consequence of that then is, is what? As, as it relates to the decision of this honorable court in, in Severin and Nerve, mm -hmm. there, there is no clear way as to how to proceed, either to resentencing and whether or not there will be the need to categorize um, murders and have them in certain categories so that you would then be able to determine based on what is before you how you proceed to actual sentencing. But you still have the mandatory death penalty? It is still on, it's, it's still on the books. No, it's still on the books, but it's not lawful. Based on this order from the, order from the court, yes. Because it, the court has declared that it is yes, unconstitutional. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. And therefore, judges are not permitted now to sentence anyone to a mandatory death penalty. That is correct. It is that simply is that the legislature has decided, has not been able to decide whether and if so how to categorize murders or whatever procedural steps can be taken, but that does not debar the judges from granting discretionary sentences in cases of murder. That is correct. And those discretionary sentences could include a death sentence, of course. That, that's correct. Mm. That is correct. Did you, are you able to tell us what has been happening in the last couple of months with respect to any uh, sentencing after uh, a murder conviction? Well, um, Your Honor, nothing really has happened in, in relation to resentencing um, because the, 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 the judicial officers are, were awaiting this particular piece of legislation, which once it was passed, the intention was then to have rules pursuant to it, which would affect the present um, Criminal Procedure Act, because then you need to make adjustments to the Criminal Procedure Act in terms of how you will proceed um, with the resentencing one, and then secondly, with future cases of murder. 
So that's where we are at at the moment. So if someone is convicted of murder, what happens today? Well, they, 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 have, not done, they have ceased doing murder trials <laughs> pursuant to this order at the moment. But it has to do with those persons who were convicted before the, the ruling of this honorable court. And it, it is being, this, the legislation is anticipated, it may be written on it, in terms of how, how, you, how you proceed. Mr. Blackman, yes, I, I'm very saddened to hear you say what you just said. He's doing it. Yeah. There, there are three arms, three co-equal arms of government. And one of those arms is entitled and is mandated to interpret the Constitution. And when that arm, i.e. the judiciary, determines that a sentence is unconstitutional and void, then that's the law of the land. You know, I was in the Eastern Caribbean court when we declared that the mandatory death penalty was unconstitutional. And the following week after that decision, I sat in court and had to deal with murders. And I gave discretionary life sentences because that was the law of the land. In fact, we went further because the Court of Appeal decision determined at the time that the decision as to whether to give a death sentence or not should be made by the jury, not by the judge. And so we proceeded to have the jury make those decisions until the Privy Council reversed that part of the decision. So that I'm, I'm, I'm very saddened to hear you say that the judges are awaiting legislation to go about their business. If there aren't rules, then the Chief Justice must make the rules. But anyhow, that's a different And, and that no more trials yes. are taking place? I mean, that's that amazing. Yeah. yeah Mr. I, Mr. Blackman, I'm afraid to ask the next question, but I think <laughs> I will. So when, pray tell, will the murder trials restart? Your Honor, I, 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 never, I am unable to. No, but what I don't understand is what is the obstacle in the way of a murder trial? That's the responsibility of your office, I take it. Yes. To bring a charge of So what is the obstacle? I, I, I'm trying to understand. Um, I would answer your honor, your honor by saying that. I'm not even sure if what the obstacle is, to be quite honest with you, sir. Um, it's, just, it's just that it's not happening. Yeah, but I hope the obstacle is not that judges and or prosecutors are simply awaiting the legislature because there is absolutely no reason to await the legislature. The legislature has its work to do and the court has its work to do. Right. There's no obstacle and you should proceed, therefore, to deal with murder cases. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, we heard you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hall, is there anything that you wish to say? Very brief, Your Honor. In relation to the case cited by my friend, the Robert Maloney case, just as it relates to the guidelines in Hogson, paragraph 21 and 22 of the Robert Maloney are, are very instructive in relation to the guidelines set out and the need and the requirement following Hogson, where the learned trial judge indicated that the cumulative effect of one, two, and three in relation to the principles. That is one, and just two in relation to, to the, the, the evidence of the psychologist, right. Sean Pilgrim, in the record, which speaks to the cross-examination by the attorney at law for the, for the appellant, in where he, when he said that that he's not familiar with the diagnostic criteria and that that will fall under the expertise of a medical practitioner, which really showed the necessity then 
for a further, further report. That is all. Okay. 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 Yes, okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Morgan. And thank you, Council, for your submissions. We look forward to the agreed uh, statement or the information about life sentences over the last 10 years and the length of time that the actual the, the, the convicted person has actually served. Um, so we hope that we could get that from As you. well as a dynamite bomb case, the three weeks. So we hope that we could get that before the end of the year. Okay. All right, we'll take time for consider, to consider our decision in this matter, and we'll let you know when we're ready. Thank you. Right.